All right, let's start with our ceilings since we're moving on down our, our spreadsheet. Our ceilings, in our particular example, our ceilings are going to fall up under an attic with dark shingles. We're going to have R19, R19 insulation. So we go to our J manual once again and we find what fits that and we find under table 4, 16B with R19, that is a 16B-19 if you're looking for the code and for our U value it is going to be a .049. So let me go ahead and identify our ceilings. And I'm gonna, I gotta go, y'all remember, I almost done something wrong there. I've gotta go to the tab that says ceilings. So let me do that. There it is, ceilings. Okay, you can see that it says table 4A, construction number 16, 17, and 18. And we are using 16B-19 as our reference. 16B-19. Okay, our U value for that was 0 .049. So let's put in 0 .049. Okay, in order to get our cooling temperature differential, we come over back to our J manual and if you recall we had a 15 degree temperature differential and a daily range of medium. So I look up under that and it tells me to use 50 degrees or 50. Okay, That's based on degrees is what that's about. Okay, where do they come up with those kind of figures? If you've ever been up in an attic on a 90 degree day, how hot is it in that attic? Of course that has to do with some of the ventilation and things such as that, but add 50 to 90, that's 140, right? Isn't that about what it seems like it's going to be in the attic? That's where they come up with that cooling temperature differential. It's actually going to be 50 degrees, uh, probably above the ambient, and then if you subtract the 70 degrees out of that, uh, you, you, you'll, you'll come up with a little bit cooler than that, but uh, I have seen attics that got awful warm. It's probably going to be more in the neighborhoods of around 110, 120, hopefully, but no more than that. But that's, we're looking at temperature differentials. That's, that's the important thing. All right, we have that information, so we now go to our J1 form once again, and we need to know what is, after I put this on, oops, there we go. I need to know how many square foot of ceilings I have. We're only concerned with the condition space. I've already done a little math. All of our ceilings are the same. Uh, we have 1,360 square foot of ceilings. So that's the number we're going to put in there. 1,360. Okay. Now, we come to our floors. Our passive floors, that's the type of floors that we have. Well, you may say, what in the world is a non-passive floor? If you have radiant heat in the floor, that is considered to be a non-passive floor. A regular floor with no heating in it, that's a passive floor. Now, once again, we're going to have to go to our J manual to get that information to be able to come up with our U values. I hope I can flip to that pretty quick. Uh, ceilings, exposed beams. I didn't quite get prepared for that one, so bear with me. But we are here, I believe. Our floor is actually over an enclosed, unconditioned crawl space. Okay. In fact, that is given to us right here. Our unit shall be a split system located in the crawl space. It tells us that our floors are passive with an R13 under unconditioned enclosed crawl space. Okay, so we need to look at this information 
and we have both heating and cooling criteria here in the J manual. Our first part is for the heating and we're going to use uh, in both cases a 19A-13P in both cases for the uh, upper and the lower one and uh, we're going to come up with uh, excuse me just a second a, 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 a 50 degree temperature differential the PTDH it's going to be 36.6 I believe that's what that reads with a uh, U value of 0 0.065 so let me that's a lot of information to remember so let me get a little bit at a time here I come up first with a 19A-13P so let me do that acid floor I've got I've got to go to floors right here on that tab floor over an enclosed unconditioned crawl space or baseboard okay and that was a I done forgot already what that was 19A-13P 19A-13P let me do that once again 19A-13P Okay, the U value was 36.6. What uh, would you look at? Should be the U value right here is 0 0.065. Okay. 0 0.065. Okay. And the petition differential for heating is 36.6. And last but not least, the petition temperature differential for cooling comes up to be 11 point, oh, that's on the wrong line. It should be 11, 11. Okay, that's in the uh, bottom part of that chart, 11. So I put that right there. And I have that information ready to go to the J manual. Or not J manual, but the J form. Okay, once again, I need to bring this information down. There. Okay, in this case, our square footage of the floors is identical to our ceilings, which is 1360 square feet. Okay, where could that be different? Let's say that maybe. The, the utility room, but this is an example, maybe the utility room uh, may have been built over the slab of the carport. Then we would have to have a different type floor, which would be, as you see, the slab here, but we don't have that. That's not a problem here. All of our floors in our example are identical. Now, believe it or not, we're coming up to near the end of this thing. Anytime that you see information that is still giving you some strange things like value you're not done okay like I said we, we're going to finish it up here we want to know what is our envelope leakage we have many choices here we're going to be using average but I want to show you what those choices are well how do you know what the envelope leakage is of course you can do a floor type uh, uh, pressure check but you don't always have that information but you do have a uh, choice between tight all the way to loose with several in between I always looked at it this way if I go in the house and I shut the front door and the back door comes open it's probably a tight house <laughs> okay <laughs> but uh, we're going to use average in this one okay and there is some specific ways to be able to come up with that okay we need to know what the heated and cooled floor area in square feet. Well, we already have that because it's the same as the ceilings or the floors. So we go ahead and put in the 1360. Okay. Now, here's a little tricky one. Above grade uh, 
cubic square feet. Now we're talking about condition square feet. Why in the world would we need to know that? That has to do with basic uh, infiltration figures and also some force air ventilation. Ours comes up with 11, I mean, excuse me, 10,880. So I'll put that figure in right there. How did I get that? The square footage times eight, the eight foot ceilings. We're looking at total cubic feet, okay? Now, what I love about this is every time I enter another number, and hopefully correct number, it fills in all the hard work. Number of bedrooms. We don't have three. How many bedrooms do we have in our structure? Two. Now notice that the occupants will change. We base, if you have a one bedroom house, then we base that with the consideration that two people are going to live in that house. But every additional bedroom, you add another person. So in our case, our occupants come up to three. Now, while I got this on my mind, these values have to equal when you do a room by room. So you have to determine where the people are gonna be when you do the room by room. That's gonna be another lesson here in a little while. But keep in mind, I can't have 10 people in a house if I only show three occupants. They gotta add up, it's gotta add up. Okay, so I go ahead and put three people right here under the block load. Notice again how the values are beginning to come together. Appliance loads. We're only given two or three choices for appliance loads. You may say, what's appliance loads? Washer, dryer, oven, uh, computers. Those are appliance loads. Those are, those are internal heat loads. In our case, we're going to use the 1200 just to uh, say that, okay? Now, when you go to the room by room, you must either put all that load in one place or you can use it out a little bit in each room, but it must add up to the 1200 BTUs or whatever your choice that you have. And here, I'm going to go ahead on the block load and put in my 1200 BTU uh, internal heat gain. All right, now I have a few other things right here at the very bottom that I must fill in. If you recall, our system we decided was going to be in the crawl space. We have a choice here. There's several choices. I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail on all of them. I'm going to pick, uh, I think that's it right there. Uh, that's not it. It's the next one down. You can see return air and supply air in closed crawl space or unconditioned basement. So we're going to pick that one right there. Okay. Now, that automatically fills in some other information for us. We can change some of that, but like I said, for what we're doing right now, we're going to keep it simple. Uh, leakage, things such as that. Uh, we have the supply return. We're we're all considering that. Our ventilation, if you have a water heater in the conditioned space, you must check that. That is, if it is a gas appliance, if it's an electric, you don't need to check that. If the furnace is in the conditioned space, you need to check that if it's a gas furnace because it has to have combustion air. Mm -hmm. That air's got to come from somewhere. Where's it going to come from? It's got to come in through the infiltration unless it is a... Uh, high efficiency that brings this air in from the outside. Alright, last but not least, we have some information that tells us that the floor heat gain, people don't realize this, but the blower in the furnace actually produces heat. So we need to take that into account. In this case, our manufacturer, we're saying that they didn't give us any discount for that. Okay, this is going to give us a total uh, sensible loss or gain. You can see it already showing up. And if we have someone who likes plants a lot, we may actually want to say that they have a lot of plants and take that into consideration. Why are we worried about that? Because plants produce, well, we water the plants. That water's got to go somewhere. The water actually evaporates out of the soil and the leaves 
as it grows, as it, as it, as it uh, nourishes itself. So in this case, we're not going to say we have any plants. Uh, the latent load for the uh, unconditioned space, we see that also for the duct in the unconditioned spaces there, ventilation loads. All right, I'm going to go ahead and summarize this thing. There's a lot of information you can get in there. You can get down to the dirty details like they say. But I don't think we're going to do that. We're going to take a look at our summary. There we go. This tells us that the block load, our heat loss, is 20,051 BTUs. Our heating CFM is going to be 800 on a, on a uh, normal unit that would be in the neighborhood. Our heat gain is 12,000. Uh, what is that? 562. Our cooling CFM is going to be 800. We look down at the bottom and we see that we can break it down into the different parts that we will figured we can get the percentages of the heat loss and heat gains but the bottom line is this equipment must be able to service those numbers okay when you do the room by room you may say hey that's not exactly the same but keep in mind this takes in duct losses and other problems that are really are truly associated with a load calculation for a building or a home. That concludes our block load. Hopefully we can do a little bit on a room by room load to show you how to determine the size of the ductwork for each area also in the near future. Thank you.